Okay, so good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining our panel, A New Agenda on Inclusive Research. I'm humbled to be a participant of this conference and I'm honored to be joined by so much brilliance. I want to take the opportunity to publicly thank the Dominican Studies Association founders for creating a space for, for scholars that care deeply about Dominican and ethnic studies. Mil gracias. My personal thanks to Dr. Hernandez from the Dominican Studies Institute for her generosity with her guidance, which helped accelerate the implementation of my study. As your moderator and presenter, I will kick off our panel by introducing myself and sharing my pre-recorded presentation to then move on into the live presentations and have time for q and I'm Evelyn Fernandez Ketchum. I identify Dominican American, a native New Yorker from Washington Heights. I'm a lifelong learner. My professional and scholarly interests center on the intersection of education, workforce and economic development as it relates to the 18 to 29 year old emerging adults in urban settings and their relationship with systems. Currently, I'm a PhD candidate in the social welfare program at Yeshiva University, Wurzweiler School of Social Work. My presentation today uncovers my research currently underway. Dominicans in an urban community college say what makes them feel like an adult. During presentations, I encourage questions on the chat or prepare your questions for after all panelists present. Uh, Diana, if you can share my presentation, please. ESA board and my colleagues, I'm grateful to be part of this panel, a new agenda on inclusive research. My presentation will open with demographical shifts in New York City and the City University of New York CUNY, which lays some of the groundwork for my research. I will then go over the definition of non-traditional students in higher education, followed by key findings from a CUNY student experience survey, along with other literature review data that encouraged additional research on the topic. I will briefly describe the theoretical underpinning for the study, what we know and don't know about 18 to 29 year olds and their transition to adulthood in general. I also highlight the importance of this study to CUNY in New York City and conclude by opening up the discussion for Q&A. There are demographical shifts happening in CUNY and New York City that set the foundation for my study that concentrates on 18 to 29 year old Dominicans. In their first compre comprehensive research report on Dominicans in higher education published by CUNY's Dominican Institute Studies Institute, Dr. Hernandez and Stevens Acevedo concluded that by the year 2002, the enrollment of Dominicans in college had continuously increased and that among Hispanic students in the City University of New York schools, 77% were Dominicans, an upward trend that continued through 2017. As of 2019, at Ostos Community College in the South Bronx, from 2014 to 2017, enrolled students that self-identified Dominicans represented 29 to 30 percent of the total number of enrolled students for four consecutive years. The increase of the Dominican population in CUNY can be explained perhaps by the increase in the Dominican population in the United States. Data from the 2019 Pew Research Center reported that by 2017, the Dominican population had grown to a little over 2 million, with over 1 million populated in the New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania metropolitan areas. Important to this study and to know that over 64% of Dominican immigrants have been living in the United States for more than 10 years. Another shift is the increase of the 18 to 24 year olds enrolling in CUNY. In 2018, Trishan and Lou reported that the number of individuals between 18 and 24 years of age 
in New York City neighborhoods, reflecting the highest concentration of this cohort in the Bronx. Trishan and Lou also included data from the CUNY's <clears throat> Office of Institutional Research, indicating an increase in the number of Latinx students enrolled in CUNY's two-year community colleges from 43% in 2006 to 62% in 2016. The masses of Dominicans in New York City and the CUNY educational system, along with the increase of 18 to 24 year olds in neighborhoods like the Bronx, call for focus on urban two-year community colleges. In this case, in the case of this study, Ostos Community College. To help us begin to understand the impact of these demographical shifts, it is important to first go over the definition of a non-traditional student in higher education. The National Center for Education Statistics and the Association of Non-Traditional Students in Higher Education define a non-traditional student as an adult learner 25 years or older. And even though the 18 to 24 year old non-traditional student that attends community college also presents secondary identifiers such as not starting college immediately after high school, having a job, being married and with a child, or enrolling in an occupational training program, they fail to include the 18 to 24 year old group in their definition. This exclusion spills over to CUNY, evidenced by CUNY's latest performance management process data book released this past summer in August. The data reported only focused on students 25 years or older, also excluding the 18 to 24 year old. Yet a CUNY 2018 student experience survey showed that CUNY wide 73% of survey participants were under the age of 25 years of age at Ostos 62%. Key to this study compiled surveyed responses for students enrolled the two year community colleges reported that at the time of their enrollment, students had aspirations of completing their associate's degree in two years, but could not do so because of competing responsibilities that prevented them from taking 15 plus credits a semester, but instead end up completing the degree in three to five years. The perception of most CUNY students from senior and community colleges were generally consistent across the board regarding three areas of interest to this study. Having to balance their time between commuting to and from school, working while going to school, and caring for others. Results from the CUNY Student Experience Survey and other literature review encouraged the study to increase understanding from the perspective of the 18 to 29 year old immigrant and second generation Dominicans regarding their own views about their experience during this period of their life. For the purposes of my study, an immigrant is defined as anybody that came to the United States after 14 years of age or older, and second generation Dominicans are individuals born in the U.S. or territory of Dominican immigrant parents or children who came to the U.S. before the age of 12 years old. Building on Eric Erickson's psychosocial theory and his proposed life stages, my study will further explore whether the 18 to 29 years of age period is a distinct stage of life or a transitional time experienced differently by individuals in that cohort and or is that experience influenced by culture, socioeconomic status and or life events. In the late 50s, Eric Erickson coined the term psychosocial moratorium, described as a time after adolescence for individuals to figure out their role in life and work, except at that time, this was thought to only apply to individuals from higher socioeconomic levels. Since Erickson's time, dramatic technological advancements have increased attention to the idea of a period when individuals do not yet feel like an adult or see themselves assuming and carrying out, carrying out adult functions, creating a need to continue to further investigate when adolescence ends and adulthood begins from the perspective of the 18 to 29 year old. About 40 years later, building on Eric Erickson's psychosocial moratorium, 
Jeffrey Arnett, a psychologist focused on the 18 to 25 year old cohort and proposed a distinct stage of life and extension from 18 to 29 years of age, calling it emerging adulthood. Arnett's suggested indicators of being in an emerging adulthood stage of life is characterized by the 18 to 29 year old period of life being a time of identity explorations, a time of experimentation possibilities, a time of negativity and instability, a time that's, fo that's self-focused in a time of feeling in between. This study will also explore an other focus factor that, in that was not included in any of Arnett's original studies, but found to be important in research conducted with samples from Latin American countries and individuals from Spanish speaking countries. On its face, one might not think that not knowing when adolescence ends and adulthood begins is a problem. However, increased understanding about the transition to an arrival at adulthood is important in the 21st century. A global economy and technological advancements require sharpened attention to our ecosystem and our relationship with it, among other changes that continue to unfold. The question at one of the questions at hand is, does globalization, culture, time and place impact how and at which point 18 to 29 year olds are undergoing an emerging adulthood stage? So in the US, there are some expectations that clearly mark a departure from adolescence. At 18 and subsequently, there are legal rights that have been assigned as markers of the beginning of individuals transitioning to and signs that they are moving toward adulthood, such as voting at 18 and drinking at 21 years old. And typically after 18, individuals are expected to begin to make what for a while we have deemed as adult decisions or moving toward adulthood by joining the military or getting a job to start off a career. There are also parental and cultural milestones, such as leaving the family's parents' home to marry and start one's own family by having children, which for women is likely to play a significant role in, in how we may feel about becoming an adult. In the United States, depending on socioeconomic background and culture, it is, it is expected that most 18 year olds, if not married, will leave home to go down in college, to go dorm in college. Away colleges offer some students the opportunity to explore and figure out their interests free of parent, parental influence. In contrast, the 18 to 29 year old community college student that commutes to school may still be living at home or living on their own while also working, at times already in a relationship with a living partner and or children, typically balancing school, work, family, friends with perhaps less time or ability to enjoy some of the freedom that students that dorm might experience. So the question around what 18 to 29 year olds think and feel about their transition to an to and or views about what makes them feel like an adult needs further exploration. In the United States, this inquiry has been mostly explored with students that dorm in four-year institutions. Few studies have been carried out with students that do not go to college. And in my review of the literature so far, I've concluded that none were found to be carried out with urban community college students that commute and of a diverse background. Not settling on when adolescence ends and adulthood begins has structural implications with financial consequences for some groups more than others. Therefore, focus on an urban two-year community college is important to advance our understanding regarding the transition of all 18 to 29 year olds from adolescence to adulthood and its implications in CUNY, the higher education system in New York City that mainly serves this group. So it is safe to say that in the last two decades or so, we have witnessed the transition to a roadmap to adulthood evolve over time. Demographical shift continue to trend away from traditional milestones achieved by previous generations 
that were thought to be signs of individuals moving into or arriving at adulthood. And so what do we know, if anything, about demographical shifts in this age cohort? For now, we have come to understand that women joining the workforce and obtaining higher levels of education hint at being a key variable influencing some of these delays, happening such as not yet marrying, having children, leaving, parents, leaving the parents' home. We know there is no playbook or switch that turns on and off or a button that can be pressed to signal when individuals psychologically begin to transition to or arrive at adulthood. There may be signs that show mature thinking. And there are behaviors that individuals in that age period may carry out that may be deemed mature enough to be considered adult behaviors. Nevertheless, we don't know from the perspective of the 18 to 29 year olds what they think makes them feel like an adult or when do they believe they have arrived at adulthood. While the subject matter is mainly debated in the field of psychology, psychosocial theory underpins my study to explore the issue from the person and environment lens, a social work perspective. The opinions of an identified group of 18 to 29 year olds will be sought to increase our knowledge about the factors that impact 18 to 29 year old Dominicans views about their psychological development. The inventory of the dimensions of emerging adulthood idea instrument also referred to as views of life survey developed by Reifman, Cowell and Arnett will be used to conduct an exploratory quantitative correlational study to survey an ethnic group of 18 to 29 year olds outside of a traditional four year college to test the generalizability of Arnett's proposed emerging adulthood concept and the applicability and replication of the idea scale in an urban two year community college with commuters to expand cross-cultural knowledge for other groups demographically and culturally, such as immigrants and second generation Dominicans in the 18 to 29 years of age cohort. So in conclusion to date, Arnett's emerging adulthood concept and Reifman and All's instrument, the idea, idea scale, have not been tested enough in diverse populations outside of a four-year traditional college. This study will examine and compare commuters at Osos Community College, immigrant and second generation Dominicans. The comparison between these two groups will contribute to the body of scholarly works in the emerging adulthood topic. Also testing the emerging adulthood concept as a cultural theory. The study will strive for increased understanding of differences that might exist between subgroups in their environment. I hypothesize that the 18 to 29 year old immigrant and second generation Dominicans at Ostos Community College will mimic Arnett's markers of emerging adulthood concept found in the 18 to 29 year old general population. The overall total subscale scores from the instrument will not be significantly different from Reifman and All's original scores from a general population. What might be different are the reasons and the results will not explain what is happening for them at this time in the different areas of their lives. In this study, it is anticipated that there will be variability among age groups like the 18 to 23 year old age group signaling to be experiencing an emerging adulthood phase versus 24 to 29 years of age group that are moving closer to adulthood. There will be very little to no difference between females and males, except for married and parenting males and females. There will be little to no difference between immigrant and second generation Dominicans. However, in the other focus category, Immigrant Dominicans will have higher mean scores, perhaps explained by cultural expectations to care for others, thus assuming adult responsibilities. Still, for both groups, caring for others will not be counter to their being focused on the self. Thank you everyone for your time.
and I will move us along. I will, uh, please, if you have any questions, you can write them on the chat, but I'd like to move us uh, to our next presenter, Dr. Nancy Lopez. Dr. Nancy Lopez is a professor of sociology at the University of New Mexico. She co-founded and directs the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Justice and serves as the Associate VP for Equity and Inclusion. Her scholarship teaching are guided by the insights of intersectionality, the simultaneity of tribal status, settler colonialism, race, structural racism, gender, heteropatriarchy, class, racialized capitalism, ethnicity, nativism, sexuality, heterosexism, as systems of oppression, resistance across social outcomes, particularly education and health, and developing contextualized solutions that advance justice and human rights. Her books include Hopeful Girls, Troubled Boys, Race and Gender Disparity in Urban Education, and Mapping Race, Critical Approaches to Health Disparities Research, and a special issue of race, ethnicity, and education on quantitative methods in critical race theory. She is also known for developing the concept of street race, and she is conducting a study of critical race intersectional ethnic studies as the lever for reducing in high schools. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Lopez. Mil gracias, Evelyn, y bienvenida, familia. So today I wanna to walk us through a research agenda that I think is um, very powerful for social justice transformations in our community. But before I start, I just wanted to um, give you a little bit of background on who I am. As you could imagine, this is uh, my baptism. In 1969, my mom from San Jose de las Mata, you know, Cibaena, came in 1965 and I was born in 69. And I think about how schools valued or didn't value the rich cultural wealth that my family um, gave me. And uh, thinking that I came from a family with a second grade education, rural, never had the opportunity to go to school um, and worked in the garment industry in the Lower East Side and how that richness wasn't, wasn't ever acknowledged in my schooling. So how can we dismantle anti-Blackness through Dominican studies, right? What's the role of centering community wealth? What is the role of oral history? I had the pleasure of interviewing my mom for uh, the Historia Core um, National Archive on Latinos across the US. How could we use that and perform in uh, visual arts? And how can we engage in implicating, um, self-implicating reflexivity? I also want you to answer this question for yourself. What is your color? What is your culture? And what is your corner? And that comes from um, Courageous Conversations by Glenn Singleton as the beginning of, of, of engaging in that critical reflexivity. And of course, um, Elizabeth Acevedo's amazing work that helps us do that. So here are some of the examples of the um, books that I've worked on. And the one that I am most proud of is Hopeful Girls, Troubled Boys, um, because it really does center the lives of second generation Dominicans like myself, born and raised in New York City, um, along with some of the other work that you'll see uh, named there. So this piece refers to um, my attempt to do engaged sociology that reaches a, a larger audience than what would be considered um, an academic audience. And this was a small essay that introduced the, that idea of street race, which basically gets us to ask the question, if we were walking down the street, what race do we think other strangers would think we are based on what we look like? To again, dismantle this idea of race as genetics or ancestry and think about it as a relationship of power. I use that measure in two articles um, that I co-authored with my colleagues in the sociology of race and ethnicity. It used a sample of about 1,500 Latinos of all backgrounds and tried to understand what were the experiences with discrimination, you know, when you shop, when you go access healthcare, employment, et cetera, as well as what impact does that embodied social climate have on your physical health and mental health? And there were very little surprises, right? If you're racialized as a Black Latina, as I am, 
or um, brown or Arab, you're um, predicted to have different outcomes. And that was very gendered. I love this quote because it comes from uh, Bakazin and Zambrana's uh, latest contribution to how Latinas contribute to intersectionality. And the last line here says, when we use the term Latinas, it's not as a unitary term that homogenizes distinctive heritage groups, but as a term of implicit solidarity with other Spanish colonial history and gene genealogical, political, clear, um, cultural, and ethnic ties to Latin America. So this is an important concept because it helps us understand that in order for us to be in, in solidarity, we need to practice intersectionality. This is another beautiful concept that comes from Kamara Jones, and she talks about the levels of racism and understanding that it's not just the internalization and that interpersonal racism, but how does it get institutionalized and how can we practice anti-racism and create solutions for dismantling anti-blackness, right? In our own families, in our own social networks and in our institutions. I also will use this image to ask you who's of the Latino race. I have cousins that look like each and every one of this. And uh, if we were to continue to measure race simply um, by ignoring the reality of the difference in um, street race, then we will lose the ability to document inequalities by race and gender by street race. So I argue for the census in particular, and I'm hoping some of you will still get the American Community Survey <laughs> so you can still answer the question in a way that really reflects your race for civil rights enforcement, right? So family members of the same ethnic background, you know, we could all be Dominican, Puerto Rican or, or Cuban should answer that race question to re reflect their street race so that we could rectify any inequities when we go vote or look for housing. I love Bonilla Silva's work. If you haven't read um, Colorblind Racism in the Post-Civil Rights Era. Um, and he talks about anti-racism beginning with the institutional nature of racial matters and accepting that everyone's um, affected materially and ideologically by the racial structure. Here's just a sampling of all of the um, research evidence that shows that you should not ask for two concepts and one question. And that's typically what we do. We're asking about your nationality, your ethnicity and your ancestry and race in one question. And that impedes our ability to document the real differences in lived experience. So I'll just point out one of these studies, a Turner um, study did Aud, um, housing audits where people just went knocking on doors, 8,000 in 29 different cities. And of course, it wasn't that the discrimination um, had completely disappeared when you call and you had a so-called different name, but it was mostly when you showed up at the door, i.e. your street race. And how do we use that um, to advance justice? Same is true for criminal justice. We see that people who presumably have committed the same crime are treated very differently with Black Latinos in particular experiencing something very different. I also love this quote. It was unsolicited and it came from someone who attended a, one of the talks I gave on street race. And she says that she's Latina and that her street race is white. But this concept made her think a lot about her own journey and understanding her relationship to race and ethnicity. It's something that made her uncomfortable, but excited. And that's the kind of spirit of uh, critical reflexivity that I hope we all engage in. Um, because again, the minute that we lose that, we, we sell out. So I'll turn now to talk about the research that I've been doing recently here in uh, Albuquerque in partnership with um, some colleagues in uh, Los Angeles and in San Francisco, California to look at the role of ethnic studies as a space to institutionalize the dismantling of racism and anti-Blackness and anti other intersectional violences. So this quote again comes from Patricia Hill Collins and she says, critical race studies aim to resist racism, feminist studies resist heteropatriarchy and decolonial studies resist neocolonialism. In this sense, each project reflects the particular social problems confronting black people, women and colonized people. But this is the most important part. Each project also sees beyond the particulars of any group because it means that you are practicing flexible solidarity, that you are rooted in your experience, but also able to shift and understand and create empathy and bridges of liberation for others that are different from you. So I ask ourselves, how can we work towards decolonizing knowledge production? 
um, and teaching and pedagogy? How do we center community wealth? Um, and of course, how do we honor this? So part of what I did with my colleagues that you see here, and if you want more information, you can visit the website for the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Justice, which I co-founded and still direct um, over 10 years ago at the University of New Mexico, is click ethnic studies, you'll find videos. But what we did was say, what happens when researchers and um, administrators and teachers and community get together and produce knowledge for liberation how can we help with the implementation of ethnic studies? At least 20 states have implemented ethnic studies and how do we keep it real, right? How do we keep it from getting co-opted? We know there's a reason why there was an executive order recently issued outlawing the 1619 project and any teaching about anti-racism or sexism, right? So uh, this is a mixed method study on ethnic studies and it looks at how high school class classes are a lever for reducing intersectional inequality. Um, we know that um, this is powerful. So like I mentioned, there's at least 20 states that have implemented some version of it. So how do we engage in working the cracks, right? Institutionalizing inquiry and praxis for liberation. And these are just quotes from some of the teachers that we've interviewed. Um, this is uh, about 16 teachers. Um, half of them were BIPOC, Black, indigenous or other people of color, including, of course, Latinx. And they were saying, if it were a core course or a required course, not losing the elective credit, but say that we could lobby the state into allowing it to count as an English requirement or a social studies replacement or legitimize it in terms of an English credit or a social studies credit, we could probably have a lot more weight. So this is them thinking creatively because there will be resistance, right? In terms of instituting a new graduation requirement, how could we transform what's already considered core knowledge and make sure that these learning outcomes are there? They also said, I would love to see every, uh, that it is everybody that would have to graduate with an ethnic studies. It's beneficial for everyone. It's not just for BIPOC youth. It's also about transforming critical consciousness, right? And what about, why couldn't we also have an ethnic studies requirement I think it's gonna open up many conversations with the student teachers and hopefully at home with friends and it will blossom and students um, will transform. In other words, this is not only about individual transformation into personal transformation, but it's institutional, it impacts the community. Um, I'm almost done. So I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Oh boy, now it's not moving. How interesting. <laughs> okay, conclusion. So ethnic studies pedagogy, as you know, has implications for recruitment and hiring of teachers. So how do we change our teacher licensing and how do we keep it critical race and intersectional? Um, how do we keep it from being co-opted, right? How can we resist? How do we work the cracks? Um, I also wanted to let you know that there was um, a lawsuit that was successful here in the state of New Mexico that talked about the history of settler colonialism, anti-Blackness, and all of the other intersectional violences that was successful. It's called the Yazi um, Martinez Consolidated Case against the state of New Mexico saying, there has been institutionalized you know, discrimination and we need to address it. And finally, I'll just mention, these are some of the solutions that the teachers we interviewed pointed to. Um, they talked about how we need to make sure that administrators know that this is important, that we have to have multiple pathways, that we need to make sure it's available, not only in high school, it's almost too late in high school, but obviously we do need it there. We need to start this earlier. It should also be part of higher ed. It has to be part of teacher licensing and um, it should be uh, available for all. Last um, slide I'll show you is why intersectionally matters in order to document inequities. And this is part of a special issue on critical race theory um, and quantitative methods that I co-edited. So this looks at graduation. This is college graduation, but this is the type of study that we could do in high school too. And says, what happens when we look at complex uh, social locations, right? It's not enough to look at race alone, gender alone, or class alone we actually have to look at um, all of those things together. And what we see is that if we were just looking at income and a lot of state funding formulas assume that income is a proxy for race or gender gaps, no, it's not. Um, 
then we would miss these major disparities. These are the odds of graduating so that, um, for instance, uh, Asian and white low-income women are only 14 times less likely to graduate compared to Hispanic low-income men that are 24% less likely, uh, Hispanic low-income women 23% less likely, and American Indian uh, low-income women and men that are 43 and 39% less likely. So again, intersectionality helps us solve problems that make the invisible visible. I will end by saying we need to engage in flexible solidarity. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. Uh, very powerful from critical reflexivity to street race uh, to get us to get at discussing the impact of the color of one's skin uh, that what it has in everyday life. Thank you so much. I will move us now to our third presentation. Dr. will be joined by Dr. Argueros. Uh, scholarly interests are in the areas of urban sociology, race and ethnicity, immigration and social demo 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 demography. Uh, his current research examines the correlates of patterns of racial and ethnic changes in urban and suburban neighborhood composition and class and race-related changes in the level of lo lo locational attainment and residential segregation between racial and ethnic groups. Dr. Arguero is currently working on a book titled The Suburban Dream, Be Visited, Processes of Black Ethnic Groups Suburbanization. He's also joined by, the, by Dr. De Filippis, uh, whose research focuses on the politics and economics of cities and communities. He is particularly interested in the process of social change and questions of power and justice in cities. His work strives to make connections, linking disciplines and connecting academic theory and grounded political practice. He has published work in academic journals in a variety of fields, both independently and in collaboration with other authors. He is the author or editor of six books and more than 40 articles and book chapters. Professor De Filippis has also written applied monographs and reports, and his interests extend well beyond the academy and into the practice of concrete political work and policy analysis. Without further ado, I will turn it over to our third panel. Um, hi, um, I'm going to speak. Um, Greg has been sick, um, and so I'm going to do the talk for um, for the two of us together. Um, thank you very much for having me here. I'm very excited to be here. I'm very excited to follow Nancy Lopez, but that is not um, easy. Although a lot of what um, what you know she was saying has echoes in what Greg and I are talking through here. Um, I want to share my screen <clears throat> and here, okay, um, and let me put it on the slideshow. Okay, um, we have a lot to get through here. Um, this is probably like a 40 minute talk that we're going to do in 15, um, but I'm from Queens and I talk fast and so that's okay. Um, we're going to start very quickly by kind of whipping through some of the, the three main paradigms in, in sociology, all of which are remarkably flawed um, and yet continue to be super influential. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about um, how Dominicans are being incorporated into the housing um, markets and housing structures in the American context, looking at what that structure is and what those markets are. And then I'm gonna talk through very quickly data and methods. Nobody really cares about data and methods. Uh, I shouldn't say that, Evelyn, you're doing a PhD right now. So everybody totally cares about methods, except when you're done doing the PhD. But in any case, um, <laughs> you guys don't know me. Um, so I probably shouldn't say all this. Um, but anyway, um, then we're going to talk through the evidence really quickly in terms of um, and that's going to be the bulk of it. So moving on, um, the dominant frameworks, it's remarkable. We still have the language of spatial assimilation. It still runs through a lot of the classic sociology that, um, you know, it, and there are critiques of it and there are debates surrounding it. Um, and, and people like um, 
like uh, Ruben, uh, uh, you know, will we'll write articles like called um, Assimilation and Its Discontents, um, but it's still a framework that we use. It takes something like Gordon's straight line assimilation model and just applies it to neighborhood and, and housing characteristics. Um, there's a whole other language of place stratification that has been basically been constructed because the language of assimilation fails to kind of recognize um, the ways in which uh, the ways in which the American context in which immigrants are coming into is not uniform and is structured, but it does so in a very in ways that are a little bit um, too too much seeing the the the, the trees and missing the forest for me. Um, um, and and then the last uh, framework is um, is what. Uh, you know, people like Alejandro Portes have talked about in terms of segmented assimilation um, without, without the, um, without a lot of the baggage that comes with from, from a lot of what people do using Portes's framework to construct something like a model minority, right, um, and construct something like a version of um, blaming in the same way that, that Bill Wilson and William Julius Wilson, um, you know, with his underclass frameworks through the 1980s and 90s, essentially made it easy to blame, um, you know, working class and poor blacks for their for their working classness and their poverty. Um, uh, Importantes's framework enables that in in immigration research. Um, anyway, moving on. There's a lot to be said about all of that. Trust me. Um, uh, the three most important things in terms of the context in which Dominicans are being incorporated into um, is that there is no construction of an American housing market without race running through it. Um, the kind of liberal fantasy that if we just sort of made everybody homeowners, everybody could be, you know, could accrue the same benefits of home ownership is a nonsense. And those benefits have always been predicated precisely on the exclusion of large numbers of people, overwhelmingly people of color. Um, you know, if we actually did have a construction of a housing market in which everybody could benefit from it, it would have to be a fundamentally different housing market. Um, second thing is that the United States for quite some time, going back to, um, to Herbert Hoover when he was Commerce Secretary before he even became president um, in the 1920s, uh, there's been a very strong kind of ideological preference for home ownership, an ideological preference that is mirrored in our policies, um, that is reproduced and reinforced in our policies that undermine the capacity of renters to have control over their lives and to, and to, to, ha to be renters and have all of their full capabilities um, as humans realized in the American context. And the last thing is, uh, is that in the last 45 years, there's been a, a long-term decline in public sector support for affordable housing and a reassertion of the commodity form of affordable housing in the dominant frameworks. Um, anyway, moving on. Um, data come from that Greg and I are working with come from the Housing and Vacancy Survey. The HBS has done every few years, three or four years, depending on the year, not doing it in 2020, thankfully, given, you know, everything 2020. Um, and, um, and so we'll hopefully we'll be doing it, they'll be doing it next year. It's a partnership between HPD um, and the Census Bureau. It's part of the rent regulatory framework that we have in New York State. Um, and so it's a unique data set that we only have in New York City because of the rent regulation frameworks that we have that came from the 1974 rent regulation law. Um, it is a large sample size of households, 32,000 New York City households, um, among which are about 2,600 um, Dominicans and Dominican Americans um, in, that, uh, in that, that sample. And this is a fun project for me. I don't get to normally do this kind of stuff where I get to sort of like pretend to be sociologist and play with big data. Um, but in any case, uh, what we're doing here is fairly descriptive statistics for exploratory analysis at this stage. Um, we're fairly early on in this process. Um, and okay, so getting to the results, right? Um, Dominicans are less likely to own um, than other Latinos and, um, and other Latinos in turn are less likely to own than homeowners, uh, than, than householders in, in New York City writ large, right? So we're looking at a gap between a, a little more than 10% um, for Dominicans and Dominican Americans 
Um, it, it goes up to a little under 20% for Latinos, the non-Dominican Latinos, um, and it's a little more, it's about 33% for, for the city as a whole, okay? Um, if you look at kind of the disaggregated and you look at tenure by type, um, one of the things that you see, and this is sort of breaking out the categories of tenure um, into a, a million different forms. And New York City is a remarkable case because we have a lot of different programmatic ways in which our housing is structured. Um, New York City might be dominated by the real estate industry, and it is, um, but there are also many of us in the city that have spent decades fighting against the dominance of the real estate industry. And one of the things that you get from that is this peculiar mix where real estate dominates, and yet we also have a whole regulatory framework to protect working class and poor people from the destructiveness of real estate capital in their communities. And we don't win enough, and, um, and real estate capital still destroys our communities more than we would like, but we've won enough to build out a framework. Um, and this is what you see, right? We have a, a strong um, rent regulated um, you know, stock. It is clear that Dominicans are incredibly dependent on rent stabilization. I know people in this group, in the D in Dominican Studies Association were disappointed that people like Jose Peralta lost um, you know, to Jessica Ramos, but I tell you, I would take Jessica Ramos, even though her family is Colombian, over Jose Peralta, and I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say it, right, because Jose Peralta unfortunately passed away, um, but Jose Peralta was a barrier to closing the loopholes that were destroying rent regulation when you have more than 45% of Dominicans in New York City or Dominican households in New York City relying upon rent regulation. Right? We got rid of the, the politicians that were standing in the way and we toughened our rent regulation laws and Dominicans benefited from that more than any other group in the city. Um, you know, and, um, and the last thing I'm gonna say about this is there's a whole category here under other regulated that Dominicans also benefit from, but there's a generational thing to that. That is when the city in the 70s and 80s was taking title to properties that landlords abandoned, um, they went into what was called an in-rem program. And, in, um, and this was a lot of what happened in the Lower East Side um, in, in Spanish Harlem um, and in Uptown in Washington Heights and Inwood as well. Um, you know, and Dominicans of a certain generation that have been here benefited a great deal from that. Um, and newer Dominicans don't have that because Giuliani got rid of that framework and sold off tax for, you know, foreclosed properties to real estate capital, basically. Um, anyway, um, Dominicans tend to be overrepresented in higher density buildings. Um, this is the, the Washington Heights story um, to, to no small degree. Um, where the, the density of the form is far greater, um, it, you know, where Dominicans are living um, in the housing Dominicans are in. I'm going to move on because I got a lot of slides to get through here. Um, Dominican um, rates uh, of, over, uh, of overcrowding are more substantial um, uh, than the city as a whole, but not more substantial than other Latinos. Um, and Dominican rates of housing problems are more substantial than the city a, a, as a whole and, um, and other Latinos as well. When you look at mice rats and you're, you're north of 40% of, of Dominican households uh, have to deal with mice or rats, you know, and you look at water leakage inside, the part, in, inside of the apartment and, and in practice, those two things are not unrelated to each other. Um, you know, you, you're looking at a housing stock that is failing um, the Dominican community in the city, it quite literally physically failing the Dominican community in the city. Moving on, um, when we talk about race and Dominicans housing, right, and I totally am so glad um, to, to be following Nancy Lopez on this, right, and the language of street race, and I totally take the point that what we put down on the government data um, is, you know, is problematic at best, and I'm relying on government data, um, even though I know it's problematic. Um, and it's particularly weird for people like me, because there is no capacity to be simultaneously Hispanic and non-Hispanic on any government thing, right? I'm half Dominican and I'm half Italian, and I cannot represent that on any government data full stop. I have to erase one or the other by definition. Um, you know, but in any case, um, white Dominicans are far more likely to own 
than, um, than non-white Dominicans, um, you know, and you see the kind of street race. I know that my experience as a New Yorker in the real estate market is different from my much darker cousins, um, you know, that are my cousins and are my family that just don't look like me, that the real estate industry just doesn't, you know, treat the way it treats me. Um, you know, if, if you look at sort of both the tenure and the tenure by type, you see it, right? You know, the owner-occupied um, conventional um, market is overwhelmingly um, white Dominicans that own it. Um, you know, and you see a bit of other Dominicans in, you know, in the private co-ops, either uptown, um, you know, but again, you see the kind of the, the stabilized um, for all, for, you know, for playing out for all Dominicans, but particularly um, for Dominicans that aren't white, um, right? And Dominicans, and I'll move on. Um, okay, um, you look at white Dominicans being disproportionately found in lower density housing. Um, if, you, if you're a Dominican in a single family house um, uh, in, in New York City, odds are really good you're white, um, you know, and, uh, um, and it plays out through the kind of the, the spectrum, uh, you know, the, the lower density housing is disproportionately, um, you know, occupied by white people. Um, uh, rent burdens, however, don't show anything, really. Like, we're not looking at any, any real difference. Um, in fact, other Dominicans are, you know, are, are sort of less burdened by rent. But, and you'll see this in a second, um, that may be because other Dominicans are incredibly overcrowded in their housing. Um, and by other, just to be clear, statistically, what, what this category is, is anyone that's self-identified in the HPS as something other than black or white. Um, you know, it could be Asian, it could be just quite literally other, um, or, you know, any number of, of, of other ways people self-identify. Um, but, you know, but the, the lower cost burden may be a function of the overcrowding. Um, we don't see much of a difference, um, uh, you know, be, between um, housing problems. And we constructed a housing problem index, um, which is basically how many, you know, what does the average Dominican in that group, how many housing problems do they have, right? Like, you know, and 1.4, 1 1.5, um, et cetera. Moving on, we're looking at time, right? Because the, the, the narrative had always been that, yeah, sure, things are really exploitative and abusive of new immigrants when they get here. Um, but, you know, over time, it gets, be it, it gets better, right? And there's a little bit of evidence in, 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 in this story that actually there is some truth in that, um, right? That doesn't justify the exploitation at the front end, um, but it does mean that people who have been here longer are doing better. Um, you know, the first generation that's been here since before 1992 um, is, you know, 15% of them own their own home and the second generation, 16.7% own their own home compared to the more recent arrivals um, that obviously are, are much less likely to own their own home. Um, you know, there's a, an interesting kind of pattern, um, right? But you see, um, you see the uh, the things you know the other regulated. This is what I was talking about. If you look at my cursor, these are the in rem housing. This is a form of public housing intervention to preserve and maintain affordable housing that the older generation got that newer arrivals cannot get, right? And you, you and you look at the kind of you know the other regulated stock, um, you know, and it's just not there. And the recent arrivals are instead in the non regulated rental, right? That is a private rental market. Um, moving on because I'm running out of time. Um, uh, one thing I'm going to say is number four, um, rent burden doesn't show benefits of time being here, right? You don't really actually see any real benefits in terms of your rent burden, um, you know, and the 30% threshold we use is a standard um, HUD definition of, of not being able to afford your rent. Um, issues of overcrowding um, is more of a problem um, for newer arrivals, much more of a problem for new arrivals um, than it is for people that have been here um, longer. Um, but um, um, but you don't see much difference in terms of housing quality problems. Um, I'm going to end with a few things. Um, first, you know, the kind of the naked thing is that there's there are real struggles with housing quality and cost that Dominicans have. 
Um, second is that there is no story for Dominicans being able to survive decently given the insane um, you know, frameworks of, of New York City real estate and real estate capital absent strong rent regulation. And every single Dominican politician, and quite frankly, every single politician in New York City that is elected to office in Albany has to fight with all that they can to protect and maintain and strengthen the rent stabilized and rent, the rent regulated in particular, and sort of more broadly, the rent stabilized in particular. Um, rent control is not something Dominicans benefit from. There are virtually no rent control units left in New York City. There are only about 25,000 rent controlled units. Um, what Dominicans benefit from, what working class New Yorkers benefit from at large is rent stabilized units. And those are not the same. Um, white Dominicans have better housing situations than non-white Dominicans in multiple ways. This is not stunning. This is the, the, the structure of, of the real estate that we have. Um, time and generation, um, time here and generation matter, but not anywhere near as much as we might want. Um, the next steps, we're going to spatialize the data. I'm a geographer by training, um, and it sort of kills me a little bit to do this without talking about space um, and neighborhood. Um, and we're going to you know, look at the data over time, um, look at multiple HVSs. Um, and finally, I want to use this. I've been working through a project um, um, I've been working through a project the last number, a few years with organizers in, in Western Queens that I've been working with um, uh, to kind of talk through a language of understanding um, migration and urban labor market and housing market segmentations in a, in a migrant society, in an immigrant society with Cedric Robinson's language of racial capitalism, um, because I find that the migration scholars um, are very useful at describing kind of how social networks reproduce like, sort of economic niches and stuff, um, uh, you know, and find durability of, of niches. Oh my God, it's crazy that the Irish show up, you know, in 1850s and work as cop and firefighters. Um, and now in 2020, there's still cops and firefighters. That's crazy. And it does without ever asking if there are larger dynamics that lead to the constant sort of creation of taking of ethnic differences and turning those into real material differences in the organization of, of the economy, taking how you believe in your God and turning that into something that matters in your labor market and your housing market outcomes. And with that, I'm going to shut up. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. DeFilippi. And I want to say, Dr. Argueros, um, I hope you feel better. Um, and so I want to open it up to, uh, for questions or any comments. Um, I know that there's been a comment posted on the chat regarding copies of the presentations. Um, and then there's another comment about that it would be interesting to see this data segmented by borrow. And I think Dr. DeFilippi, you mentioned that that's part of the next steps. Yeah, not just borough, but by sub-borough area. Uh, I mean, the ends get a little bit small. Um, and there are people here who are better at quant methods than I am. I'm trained as a geographer, which means I basically skipped out on all the quant methods parts, unless I was doing GIS, which is great. Um, but uh, but the ends get pretty small when you get to the suburb area, but the data are aggregated at the suburb area, um, which maps on, if you know New York City, not quite to community boards, but is sort of like mostly, if you think about community boards and urban politics, the, the, sub the census sub-borough areas are like, mm, like 80 to five to 90% sort of mapping on with, with those. Um, and so we'll be doing that exactly that to kind of talk through that. Um, you know, in, in another project, I worked through a kind of framework of um, how to do, you know, what the average um, person in this category, what the neighborhood characteristics are that they're experiencing. Um, and I did it for different kinds of housing market subsidies or housing policy subsidies. And, and we're going to do that for this as well for different types of Dominicans. Um, okay, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Fuentes Mayorga says, you know, it would be interesting to see a table showing the proportion of Dominicans who report are white, black, and other, or in the US most report as other, neither white or black. In the DR, only about 11% that is categorized as white. Uh, Dr. Lopez, what's your thinking on this? That's a great question. And I ask who benefits when we have colorblind data and we confuse 
nationality, ethnicity, with race. So the issue that the reason why the census says, oh, you know, we don't, we want to make everyone just identify as Hispanic is because they say, well, people don't know what it means. Well, then tell them why we collect this data. It's to find out if when we show up at the ER, you know, one person's going to get pain medication, the other one isn't, right? There's unequal treatment. Or when you go look for an apartment, or who's going to be asked for more documentation when they go vote. So I think it's our responsibility to explain. And the reason why only, you know, maybe it's 25% of, of Dominicans might be identifying as Black, there's massive anti-Blackness, not only in our community, across the globe. So we need to deal with that and recognize that when you mark five boxes, when, you're, when we're asked that question, then we have useless data for understanding the color line. Obama only marked one box. He was very clear. His mom's white, right? And, he, and his father's a Black Kenyan immigrant. We should never assume there are white people who were born and raised in Kenya too. So this tendency to kind of conflate nationality and race is a real problem. And who benefits again? We have to tell people, answer that question as, what's your street race for civil rights enforcement? Yeah. So, I mean, I hope that, um, Dr. DeFilippe, that this high level data set that you shared with us, that the next steps you, you know, we do a follow up with that because I think there are crossroads here. And I think that, you know, Dr. Lopez, your point about, um, you know, there are people who are mixed who have to make choices about which box to check off. And if it's not because we have to have uh, parents that have mixed children have to have conversations about how to do that. Um, and it shouldn't be left to that. So um, this is really important. And yeah, I mean, I, can I just jump in really quickly? I, um, I mean, I totally take um, uh, Nancy Lopez's point um, in that, you know, Dominicans on the island don't need to learn anti-Blackness um, from, from the United States. Uh, there's a very long history of anti-Blackness on the island as everyone at the DSA knows, knows full well. Having said that, if you're rationally self-interested and you're a, a migrant showing up in the American context um, and you're looking at what people have called, you know, sort of the wages of whiteness, the material benefits of being constructed as white, um, you know, you know, there's a whole set of fairly powerful structural forces in the American context that is going to make people deny blackness independently of, um, you know, of, you know, sort of anti-Haitian, um, anti-blackness on the island. Um, and I think that that sort of is a very powerful kind of dynamic um, when you've got um, the kind of the reinforcing, uh, it, it, because of different sort of historical systems, but very closely related, um, but, but not the same um, in, in, in their empirical content. Um, Are there any other questions from uh, you know, participants? I don't see any other in the chat. Um, so I want to then turn it over to the panelists if there are no questions for any last comments before I do concluding comments. Sure, I'll start by saying um, we really need to think about transforming public education <laughs> for liberation. And I think that we need to organize with grassroots organizations to think about why it is that all of a sudden all these executive orders are trying to outlaw transformative and empowering education. And why do we need critical race intersectional Dominican studies, right? Um, that would mean that we are dismantling settler colonialism, anti-racism, heterosexism, racial capitalism, all of those things. So I encourage us to think about the future. You know, what legacy will we leave back for our grandchildren and great-grandchildren? Thank you, Dr. Lopez. Any last words, Dr. De Filippi? Um, no, I, I mean, I, yes, in that there are a million things I want to, you know, sort of, I'm very excited to be sitting here with, with, with Nancy Lopez, there are a million things I'd want to kind of talk through um, in terms of, of the critical race theory and statistical methods, right? There's, that's a whole, and I, and I know that you just did the special issue, and, and, um, and I'm looking forward to kind of sitting down with that. Um, 
but there's the endless conversation when, and I don't, I tend not to do this kind of stuff, right? Where I'm kind of sitting there with demographic data and, and mapping it out. Um, but there's a whole conversation of how can you simultaneously use frameworks that were constructed in ways that are at best problematic, at worst fundamentally unjust, and then use that language, use those boxes in ways that are, you know, that, can you undermine the boxes by using the boxes or does the use of the boxes reinscribe their power? Um, is I think kind of one of the things I struggle with, um, with this kind of work, with the kind of work I just presented now. Um, you know, and yeah. so. Yeah. To be continued. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Seller, thank you so much. You had a question in terms of how to, and she's asking me, how do I anticipate that my research will help impact uh, our institution, uh, Eugenio Maria de Ostos Community College. I do hope uh, to be thoughtful and intentional about uh, how my research will hopefully improve programs for the younger end of the population that often gets dismissed in the in any system, whether it be higher education, whether it be housing, whether it be employment. So I do hope to uh, impact and then perhaps um, move to a greater st st uh, study that impacts CUNY at large. So with that, I want to say thank you to my co-panelists and participants uh, of this panel. We're coming to a close, to the end of what I believe to be a two-day of brain stimulation. There are still additional panels, so don't leave us just yet. Especially, join our closing at 8 p.m. to celebrate the conclusion of the DSA 2020 virtual conference at our host institution, Eugenio Maria de Ostos Community College in the South Bronx, New York, at which time we will receive an update on the DSA's plan for 2022. So thank you everyone, and this concludes our panel. <laughs>